Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 1993 crossover event series, Reign of the Supermen, part of the Death and Return of Superman story from DC Comics. After 50 years in the spotlight, DC decided it was time to kill Superman. Very rude. I discussed how they went about it in my last couple of videos, but for those of you who've skipped to the middle here, let's do a short recap. A giant monster named Doomsday appeared and immediately tore his way through half the country, the Justice League America, and most of Metropolis before Superman finally stopped him in front of the Daily Planet in a fight that ended both of their lives. Superman was declared dead after revival efforts failed, and he would be entombed under a golden statue in Metropolis while a plaque marking where he died would be put in the ground right in front of the Daily Planet. Cadmus would break into the tomb and steal Superman body in an effort to clone him, but thanks to Supergirl, Lois Lane, and believe it or not Lex Luthor, his body would be recovered with the fate of the cloning attempt left uncertain. Meanwhile, Superman's father, Jonathan Kent, would suffer a near-fatal heart attack, and in the resulting coma, he would dream that he entered the afterlife and saved Superman's soul, returning it to his body. In the moment that happens, Jonathan wakes up in the hospital claiming that Clark has returned. And while that claim may seem dubious at best, no sooner does he make it than there are suddenly a number of Superman sightings occurring around Metropolis. Could the Man of Steel have already returned? Or is there something else going on? Well, let's find out and take this away. The comic opens on several pages of stories that all start with the words, First Sighting. All four of these actually come from Adventures of Superman number 500, even though the main part of that comic was collected in the Funeral for a Friend collection and not in this collection. That issue was basically the last issue of that arc in the first issue of this one. And that's because these story arcs that DC currently has this broken down into, the arcs I'm using for each video, are somewhat superficial and to an extent applied after the fact. For example, while I'm splitting Rain and Return into two videos, the comics they contain used to always be collected together into just a single volume called Return of Superman. But now DC has split them into two volumes, adding back in some issues that original collection left out. Primarily, that's the Bloodlines issues from this time period about alien parasites coming down to Earth and inadvertently creating a bunch of lame new 90s heroes that everybody will have forgotten about by now. I'm not really going to waste any more time in these reviews talking about those issues because they're not really important to this story, so just a heads up on that. Back to our four sightings. The first one comes after the cops show up to break up a gang war, one involving dangerous new weapons called Toastmasters that meld people down to their skeletons. Man, gang wars and extreme violence. We're definitely in the 90s now. As the cops arrive from out of some nearby rubble left over from the death of Superman, rises a giant figure calling for Doomsday's head. The second first sighting is made by this would-be carjacker who, after failing at stealing this guy's car, runs across another imposing figure who burns him and throws him off a building. And the worst crime that this guy commits of all is that he's wearing these incredibly stupid sunglasses. Only in the 90s could anyone have thought those sunglasses looked cool. Which probably means that they're cool again because 90s styles seem to have come back lately. Unfortunately. First sighting number three is not actually a first sighting, as it takes us inside Secretive Cadmus where something has broken free of itself. Something that apparently had a Superman cape but I guess it doesn't anymore. Cadmus supposedly failed at getting a usable sample of Superman DNA, but his body was missing from its tomb at the end of Funeral. So does this mean they stole it back? No, apparently it means that they have a Superboy. Oh, uh, you don't like being called Superboy? Eh. You'll get over it. And again, speaking of 90s, the leather jacket in single ear pierced? Trey 90s. And somehow he knew to only pierce his left ear, because getting his right ear pierced would mean he's gay, and we obviously couldn't have that. 
because having just your left ear pierced is somehow so much less gay than just your right ear, because there's nothing weird or absurd about the reasoning of heteros. Nothing at all. Our last first sighting is made by a family vacationing in Metropolis, hitting all those major sites like the plaque put in the ground to mark where Superman died. Only then a Superman looking figure comes down and melts the plaque away. Which is pretty rude, that was probably expensive. But uh, that also don't look like no Superman to me, yo. Also, I love how basically the only thing he says here is, I'm back. Like, tell me that's not a Terminator reference. It's obviously a Terminator reference. Someone thought they were being hilarious right here and they were kinda right. These four Superman will be our four protagonists for the foreseeable future, with each one getting their own comic book from the four already running Superman comics. The Cyborg will get Superman from Dan Jurgens and Brett Breeding. Like all four of these characters, he'll be given a nickname based on one of the many names Superman has been called over the years, so he's apparently supposed to be called the Man of Tomorrow. Of course, absolutely no one is actually going to call him anything other than Cyborg Superman, so I don't really know why they bothered, but whatever. Sunglasses Supes will get Action Comics with Roger Stern, Jackson Guis, and Dennis Rodier as the creative team. He supposedly will be called the last son of Krypton, but like with the Cyborg, I don't really know of anywhere that anyone really calls him that until almost like the very end of this whole arc other than on this front cover, obviously. And yes, they do all get posters. It's pretty sweet. Superboy, who will insist on being called Superman, will appear in the already more youth-targeted Adventures of Superman, with Carl Kessel writing and Tom Grummet and Doug Hazelwood on art. He doesn't get an additional name because Superboy is already an alternate Superman name. Lastly, the Man of Steel, who will later become known simply as Steel, which is obviously a better name anyway, will, of course, be the title character of Superman Man of Steel. Again, someone thought they were being funny with that. A little less right this time, but yeah. This title will be written by Louise Simonson with art by John Bogdanove and Dennis Jonke. And man, I really wish I hadn't chosen to try to pronounce creator names because I have no idea. And probably the most important thing to note about this is that Glenn Whitmore did the coloring for every single one of these issues. God dang, that guy must have been tired. Some of you might already be asking, are we really supposed to believe that any of these guys can be Superman? At the very least, neither Still nor Superboy can actually be Superman. Well, if you're thinking that, you're not using comic book brain. Remember, Superman's soul was said to have been returned at the end of the last story, but there's no definite indication as to where that soul ended up. The easiest explanation, of course, since his body is missing, is that it went back into his body. That could explain Sunglasses, who looks just like Superman and seems to have his powers. Or debatably even Cyborg Superman, who will claim his body was so badly damaged in fighting Doomsday that part of him had to be rebuilt with Kryptonian technology. But that doesn't necessarily eliminate the other two. Superboy, if he really is a clone from Cadmus, like he will pretty much immediately admit to, would be the perfect vessel for Superman's soul. And this might explain why he seems to have become immediately active after Superman's soul was returned to the world. Even John Henry Irons, or the Man of Steel, who might seem like the least possible candidate seeing as he's clearly neither Superman's body or even Superman's clone, is an honestly viable candidate in comic book logic. A supposed psychic will claim later in the story that she can detect that he has a walk-in soul, meaning Superman's soul would have entered John's body, which had died when all that rubble crashed on him, and then resurrected him, which is why he's back now. So that's really all the two issues of each series collected here is about, trying to convince us that each one of these guys could be the actual Superman. So let's take a quick look at each of them and see what they each say and claim. First up is Super Shades. 
the comic will immediately present the strongest case for him being Superman. After all, we start with him in the Fortress of Solitude, coming out of some weird Kryptonian machine as some weird energy spirit. He realizes he died, but that he's somehow alive again, and after using some machines in the fortress to refresh his memory, he decides he needs to retrieve the body of Superman from under its tomb. So he does exactly that. In apparently restored, he returns to the fortress where we learn that something called the Kryptonian Regeneration Matrix restored him and provides him with power, since he can apparently no longer directly absorb energy from the sun. Which apparently also means his eyes are weak to bright lights, which is why the HD vision shades. After getting updated on the situation in Metropolis, he decides he's needed there, so the fortress robots, who obey him like he's Superman, help him get dressed up into his new outfit and he heads out to punish crime. This includes the scenario we saw in Funeral for a Friend, where he kills a guy attacking a woman as she tries to do laundry in the basement of her apartment building, and that would-be carjacker we saw get roasted and thrown off a building earlier. While out, he also runs across Lois Lane, who will meet with each of the four new Supermen in turn in order to kind of convince us that even she thinks they're Superman. And being Superman's bride-to-be, she would of course be the expert in whether someone is really Superman or not. But the yellow shade Superman leaves her a bit uncertain. She says that he looks just like her Clark, but that he doesn't have the warmth, the empathy of Clark. And our mystery man will claim that Kent is dead and only Superman remains, which is perhaps meant to explain to us why he's a more brutal enforcer of the law now. Next, he runs across Guy Gardner, who has returned to Earth to discover all these Supermen running around, and he's not too happy about it. So Guy dukes it out with Shady McGee, and the fight ends with Shades throwing Guy into a building where some bad guys were up to crimes, like bad guys do, and this supposed Superman takes a break from his superhero brawl to brutally beat down these baddies. Guy likes what he sees and decides that whether this Superman is the real thing or not, he's the Superman that Guy wants around. So Guy publicly endorses him in an interview, in the typical Guy Gardner fashion, and being endorsed by Guy is enough to make this maybe Superman question whether or not he's going about things the right way. And well it should. That guy is the worst. I'm totally gonna lose subscribers from how much I hate on Guy Gardner. I should probably stop, but it's so fun. Next up is our debatably next most likely candidate, the Cyborg Superman. Cy starts his time on page by breaking down the door to Cadmus in the search for Doomsday. Remember I said in my last video that Cadmus took him? Okay, technically they were stopped and Star Labs took him, but Cadmus just came right into Star and took him back, so I was trying to give myself a shortcut, but I ruined it by explaining this all anyway. Cyborg Supes considers Doomsday too much of a danger to leave on Earth. After all, if Superman can come back to life, Doomsday might just do the same. So Cyborg takes the seemingly dead monster up into space and ties him to an asteroid, sending him out to drip forever in the universe. Which logically would probably work given the distance between planetary objects in the universe, but in comic books that pretty much guarantees that someone will find him and he'll be back. Especially with the comic book not at all subtly hinting that Doomsday, in fact, is still alive. After dropping off Doomsday, Cyborg meets with Lois, claiming that his memory seems to be gone since he returned, with only snippets remaining like a farm in Kansas and the name Kent. Still not fully convinced, Lois brings the Cyborg to Professor Hamilton, who had studied both Superman and the Kryptonian technology known as the Eradicator. I'm not bringing that up for any reason, I swear. From that experience and expertise, Hamilton concludes that the Cyborg's human half was Kryptonian DNA, and his robotic half is made from definitively Kryptonian technology, leaving Hamilton convinced that the Cyborg is the real deal. Yeah, you take that heroic stance, Cyborg. Cyborg's second story here is a unique one that I think is easily one of the most memorable issues of the entire Death and Return arc. 
It focuses on Ron Troop, who had been one of the background Daily Planet newsroom characters leading up to this point. With Clark missing and presumed dead, Ron joins others from the Daily Planet in packing up Clark's apartment so it can be sold. He also asked Perry White for the chance to have Clark's job, and Perry asked him to prove that he's worthy of it. So, in an effort to find a story worthy of the great Clark Kent, Ron finds himself at the White House while it's attacked by Karakian terrorists. Crack, for those who don't know, is a fictional stand-in that DC uses for all West Asian slash Middle Eastern countries and the birthplace of the hero Sinbad who I talked about in the previous video. Cyborg Superman shows up and stops the terrorists, showcasing his cool shape-shifting robot abilities and heroism, but in the process gets attacked by the White House's own security system since they don't recognize him. But Ron, making himself part of the story like only Daily Planet people can do, uses a scanner to identify the Roboman, leading to the White House's own systems also identifying him as Superman. Psy insists that the attack might not be over and wants to use the White House's computer system, which is apparently linked to basically every other computer system in the world. Because, remember kids, this was pre-World Wide Web days of the internet if you can believe such a time existed. Since the scans identified him as Superman, they go ahead and let him into their system, something I'm totally sure won't become an important plot point in the next story. No sir. And he identifies that the terrorist had also managed to hide a bomb in Maxwell Lord's briefcase, since Lord was visiting the White House at the time, without even Lord being aware of it. With the day finally saved, Cyborg is fully officially accepted by the government as the real deal, and even President Clinton accepts him. And if Clinton accepts him, then you know it must be legit. Have you heard that guy play the sa- I'm sorry, I don't know what's up with that joke. Guess I just want to avoid all the other obvious jokes about Clinton. Cyborg also gifts the White House a special communication device, and I'm sure that also won't become important at some point in the future. The thing I love about this issue, though, is that up to this point, it's all told to us completely from Ron's perspective, in the form of the article that he's writing for the Daily Planet. I always enjoy comics that find different ways of telling a story, and this was a very clever workaround to avoid giving us the story from the Cyborg Superman's perspective. Not that there's any reason we'd want to avoid hearing his inner monologue during this story or anything. <laughs> Think they bought it? Okay, good. For this story, Ron gets a front page byline in Clark's job at the planet. Good for him. Next, we move to John Henry Irons, who is actually living under the name of Henry Johnson. Totally gonna fool everybody, I'm sure. He lives in Suicide Slum, basically the Metropolis equivalent to Harlem, where he volunteers to look after the local youth. So you know right away that he's a good, good guy. Only one of those kids is immediately gunned down by one of those Toastmaster things during a drive-by shooting. Holy shit. This story starts with a kid being killed? Holy crap, DC. This shit just got real. John Henry tries to stop the shooters, surprisingly managed to catch their car while on foot, but they leave him smeared against a wall. While in the hospital recovering, we learn a little of John's backstory, but I'll just go ahead and dive into it all here. At least as much as we're gonna get in this collection. It seems John Henry Irons was once a brilliant scientist who was designing weapons for the US military alongside fellow scientist and love interest, Dr. Angora Lapin. Lapin? Dr. Angora Lapin. I don't know how you're supposed to say that. Only his weapon designs ended up in the hands of Karakians. Remember how I mentioned them earlier? And at that point, they were then used to massacre Kurdish rebels and civilians, reflecting the real-life massacre of the same group done by Saddam Hussein in Iraq using American weapons supplied by the CIA. Man, this, this story is pretty depressing. Disenchanted with his life's work, John Henry destroyed the prototypes so the government couldn't have them anymore and returned home to Metropolis where he began living as Henry Johnson and working as a construction worker. His life was saved one day by Superman. Oh hey, that kind of looks like my intro image, neat. And following that, John Henry felt he owed his life to Superman. But right after that, Superman died fighting Doomsday and J.H. was buried under a collapsing building. 
He then seems to give a description of the events of Adventures of Superman number 500, you know, the whole angels and demons and granddaddy thing, that vaguely describes the metaphysical events of that story. Angry that his guns seem to have now found their way onto the streets and been used to kill that poor kid at the beginning, John forges a suit of steel so that he can go out and fight the gangs of the city and track down the supplier. The supplier is a woman calling herself the White Rabbit, and Lex Luthor, hoping to get one of the new Superman into his pocket, tracks down the White Rabbit for John Henry and feeds him her location. And the rabbit is, of course, his old love interest, Dr. Lappin. I'm going with Lappin, I guess. She also tries to persuade John Henry onto her side, but when he refuses, she shoots him out of a window and then disappears. Leaving us to the last of our four supermen, Superboy. Superboy's issues are basically the complete opposite of Steel's in terms of tone. The issues excessively emphasize his teenagerness, or at least what DC believed teenagers to be like at the time. So basically, he's a big spaz and only really interested in video games and girls. To the point of sexual assault. Yeah, that's super cool. Nothing says hero like forcing women to kiss you or randomly abducting them without cause. <sighs> The woman he abducts is Tana Moon, who had been working for the Daily Planet but felt underappreciated there. Superboy had shown up to speak with Lois, upset that other Supermen were getting coverage when he believes himself to be the real thing, even though without being pressed in the slightest, he caves and admit he's a clone. He also calls Lois old, even though she's like, what, mid-twenties? But that's how kids are, am I right? But when he sees Tana storming out of the planet, he follows her and kidnaps her, but rather than being horrified like you would probably expect, she realizes she can use Superboy's attraction to her to garner exclusives. So she immediately sells this idea to Morgan Edge's Galaxy Broadcasting System, scoring an interview with Superboy and exclusive footage of him taking out some minor supervillain and his henchmen. Luther also tries to win over Superboy to his side, quickly realizing he can use Supergirl's, um, talents to get him to agree to pretty much anything. Only Luther plays it a little too cool, leaving signing him to a deal until the morning, while later that night, Edge uses pretty much the exact same tactic on Superboy. Meeting, ironically, in Clark Kent's now empty apartment, a skeezy agent named Rex Leach uses his own daughter, Roxy, to coerce Superboy into signing his life away. Locked in now, Morgan uses this to hire a Deathstroke knockoff, calling himself Stinger. Stinger was probably intended to be a recurring villain for Superboy, but this will prove to be one of his only appearances. But he's no joke. He keeps Superboy off balance long enough for Lex Luthor to decide to send in Supergirl to help the kid out. But since Singer's deal wasn't to fight two super beings, he decides to simply blow up the Metropolis Hobsneck Bridge and flee. The bridge collapses on Superboy and Supergirl, leaving them buried under rubble while people die. Meanwhile, out in space, a strange ship is shown approaching the Earth. And that is, weirdly enough, where the collection ends. And that's because the entire focus of the story is about to change. So if I'm going to hurry up and get to that, I better bring this to an end and get to the breakdown. As I pointed out earlier, these issues used to be included in the Return of Superman collection, so as you can probably imagine, they don't really stand on their own as a complete story. And that's definitely on display here. This is an incredibly transitional collection. These issues are barely just starting to set the stage. That being the case, this volume certainly is weak, which is why it's maybe a little pointless to cover it as not part of the bigger event going on around it, but whatever. On the other hand though, these are all really strong issues that feel to me absolutely critical to being part of the story. While I personally could leave out the sunglasses Superman issues, the cyborg Superman stories are really well written and drawn. Both are powerful and memorable and the prove it issue is such a unique form of story. 
storytelling. The Man of Steel issues are probably the best here though. John Henry as a genius who's trying to make up for the mistakes of his past while the story draws on a number of real world events to grounded superhero action is a great formula for success. And Steel immediately stands out from all the other new heroes being created at the time because of it. It is a bit of a shame though that mainstream comics couldn't ever really see a black superhero as someone who didn't just fight black crime in black neighborhoods. It kind of perpetuates myths of black exceptionalism and black crime being more violent and destructive while also trying to act more inclusive and diverse. It's especially weird at the point where a gang is filming themselves attacking Steel and the filmmaker is this Spike Lee analog who's just some petty thug that shoots his fellow gang member to keep him from snitching. Seems pretty belittling of a pretty good filmmaker to me, but I don't really know what they were going for there. I also have some issues with how DC presents Superboy, but even in the somewhat problematic nature of his early appearances, you can already tell that there's the DNA of a great character in there. That's a bit of a joke, you see, cause, cause he's a clone. You get it. So I'm giving this series a recommendation level of medium. As I said, it doesn't really stand on its own, but it still manages to do a lot with what it is. The collected edition gets one super sweet set of yellow shades. Yeah, that's going in the good category. How could it not? Have you seen how cool those sunglasses are? Honestly, while I may not like the Bloodlines issues, it's nice that DC created a more complete collection for this era, even if it meant splitting these stories somewhat unnecessarily into two collections. It also includes the art for those four posters mentioned on the opening covers, and some behind the scenes design art for each of the four characters, although it does include a spoiler for one of them, so a bit of a warning on that if you're trying to avoid those. Thanks everybody for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. We're getting closer and closer to that big 1k so once again please be sure to like, subscribe, and especially to comment. I greatly appreciate all the support all of you have given me so far and look forward to you guys continuing to join me on this journey for a long time to come. One more Superman story to go and then maybe we'll move on to some X-Men. So be sure to stick around for that and I hope to see you then right here in the comic cave.